thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zaim, and thank you to all the participants, and thank you uh, to KSI for hosting this uh, and also inviting me uh, to moderate this. I have been listening to the discussion quite intensively in the morning session and the last session. And it's all about rebuilding ASEAN uh, in the current pandemic, in the current challenges. Uh, but this session takes on the theme of rebuilding ASEAN towards sustainable recovery. Sustainable recovery, not just in the economic sense of the word, uh, but in environmental, social, uh, and governance. Uh, and that is bringing people to the center of economic development, not just people, but also environment. And central to this is good governance, transparency, uh, accountability, uh, human rights, uh, and things very often businessmen might not like to talk about, but it's critical and important because it impacts people, it impacts trade, uh, it impacts uh, international relations, uh, but most of all, it impacts lives of ordinary people uh, in which business plays a major part uh, in not just generating wealth, uh, but also well-being. Um, in the context of security, uh, as well as in health uh, and sustainability as a whole of uh, the community. Now, our session has a special address by a very special Malaysian, whom we all know very well, um, um, a business, uh, we might say business tycoon, um, entrepreneur, uh, but also a philanthropist, uh, very much into um, community and social work uh, and technologist and so forth. Uh, Datu Sri Dr. Vijay Iswaran, the executive chair of the QI Group, uh, also an educationist, Datu. Uh, so over to you. I think somebody will remind us of the timing, but you have more time because you are giving a special address, uh, and, you, and I'm told you have 15 minutes. Dato Sri, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Great. So, uh, Professor Dato, Dr. Denison Jayasuria, um, a good friend, and very happy to be in familiar company. Um, greetings, of course, to Dato Sri Muhammad Iqbal Rautha and to Tan Sri Michael Yeo. Um, I have always taken um, great pleasure in addressing these uh, forums and uh, seeing familiar faces helps uh, set the pace. And then we have, of course, Professor Annie Cole, <laughs> same neighborhood. So um, the thing is, um, I think it is important that we define what sustainable business leadership is all about. And that's the direction in which we are heading and why it matters. I think uh, it is critical, at, particularly at this juncture, uh, to discuss this issue of when a business owner and a management team conduct their work with a concern for the environment, for the community and the society around them, as opposed to just decisions purely made on profit. Sustainable leadership in business has other implications, the ethos that exudes onto the staff and business as a whole, because this in turn has its ripple effect throughout society. And if a company is built on foundations that have sustainability at its heart, then this will shine through a range of elements. In the world of business, uh, changes have happened at a global scale right now. Coming out of this pandemic is what we are all waiting for, the new norm, so to speak. And as it, interesting as it may be, the new norm has already come into place. And um, the fact of the matter is that the new norm is divided in essence by the generations. The millennials, the centennials, the gen alphas, they have already leapt into it. 
and they are lapping it up. They are used to it. They are adjusted to it. The rest of us are, in a sense, following suit. And um, in a way, I think uh, what's critically important uh, is that the last two decades in particular have brought some monumental changes. When we began our company, which is about 23 years ago, the world was opening up and it was becoming um, basically a more friendlier, the boundaries were coming down, uh, international markets were opening up and that's where e-commerce was thriving. Hence, other companies apart from us, Amazon, Alibaba, uh, Facebook, etc., started around the same period as we did. The last 23 years for us has been a very interesting ride, if I may say that. But the thing that is, I think, cardinally important to note is that we went through the opening up of all of these markets and then subsequent to that, the polarization. The various you know, political changes leading to the trade blocks that are now currently going on, the, the discussion of the previous group was very interesting to me. You know, whether it is a question of, you know, RCEP versus, uh, you know, TPP-11 is basically moot, right? The issue, I think that is fundamentally important, perhaps if I may just step back a little bit, because I have the advantage of addressing this uh, in terms of creating a platform. I don't think we need to, you know, go too much into sustainability simply means that we need to remember that ultimately moving ahead, we need to have you know, a place at the table, negotiating table, so to speak. Now, as individual countries, the 10 countries of ASEAN cannot take any position on the trade blocks or, or any of, whether it's RCEP, whether it's TPV 11, or you know, being, influenced, uh, being an influence in China or the US, we are just, too much of midgets, so to speak, on the world scale. None of the countries in ASEAN have that kind of economic clout. But when we come together, then ASEAN is indeed an economic block by itself, and one that we cannot ignore. 600 million people with the fastest growing middle class in the world, arguably with the fastest growing economies, make us prime in terms of you know, um, the best platform for the new millennium. They talk of this being the Chinese millennium. They talk of it being the end of the, you know, uh, the, U the US millennium or the beginning of the Indian millennium. But let me say to you, people who are coming in to discuss this, if it is the ASEAN millennium, it is us. But the only thing that we need to do is actually recognize that we need to come together because together, the purpose of ASEAN, when it came together at that time, was at that point to balance the Cold War and to prevent us being influenced by any particular party. I don't think that purpose has changed very much. In order for us to have a future worth talking about, a sustainable future worth talking about, we need to first stabilize and bring you know, strength to the negotiating table, to ASEAN in particular. I believe, that we cannot, you know, in any sense of the word, forget why we came together and why ASEAN has such a powerful role to play. We have always been at the crossroads of the world, in between, you know, China, India, between the East and West. And we have a, a very unique role to play if we just knew how to come together. And if the ASEAN nations could actually, you know, bring down the boundaries, create our own trade block as it were. ASEAN itself is a formidable market. And that is something that I think uh, any one of us being business people here within the 10 nations would recognize. Now, having said that, we need to be clearly sustainable. So on a more um, singular note, which is with regards to the companies themselves, sustainable companies themselves, we cannot be profit driven as we were. The last you know, millennium was all about profit. Ever since the Wall Street, Wall Street crash, all the way down towards you know, the, the advent of this millennium, it's been driven by profit. And the result of that clearly we can see in the 
Facebook debacle that has just recently occurred. Profit, when you're driven by profit, has a challenge that in today's economy, in today's diaspora, in today's you know, um, environment, is something that everyone you know, in uh, all of the various stakeholders are watching and they are not just watching, so is the millennials, the centennials and the people who are coming into the workforce and the potential customers, so to speak. So we need to be very clear that I think purpose-driven companies or purpose-led companies are, we need to live their values. They should use their purpose to inform at the highest levels of decision-making. This value should be continuously referred to in order to guide businesses, not only in their initial response to crisis, but also to recover and thrive post-crisis as we are doing right now in terms of the pandemic. The pandemic has prompted the demand for purpose-led businesses, I believe, and the spread of this pandemic has made the interrelationships between companies, communities, employers, employees, customers, and other stakeholders glaringly clear. It's working to create a safe environment for everyone, reconfiguring supply chains and providing more sustainable uh, and more generous payment terms to customers, providing products, expertise to the community and to the world at large. In fact, the one thing that COVID-19 has brought to all of us, we need to basically work together in order to survive. We need to basically look past our differences. We have been too focused on looking inward we have been too focused on the unfortunate developments of the last decade where we have brought more, built more walls than bridges. In terms of the QI group, we may seem rather varied and diverse. The common thread that runs through all our businesses and every entity is a desire to make positive social impact. So when we began way back in 98, we had a slogan, we called it rhythm. And RITM simply stands for R-Y-T-H-M, raise yourself to help mankind. Now at first glance, it may look like a slogan, it might look like you know, PR, but in actual fact, it's something that has driven our strategy, has driven um, our marketing, driven our policies, and till today, it is part and parcel of our culture. Now we have, you know, um, easily in, in the region of uh, uh, 30 to 42 offices, depending on how you look at the group across the world. And that is bringing together somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 different cultures, languages, countries, nationalities. It's a virtual little UN. So within this little environment, microcosm, if you like, we have strived to bring the borders down. We have striven to make, make us all recognize that ultimately we are one. And our, how we have done this is we, by letting our employees work um, towards building a social partnership, so to speak, to the communities around them. Our employees dedicate hundreds of hours every year towards volunteering in their local communities. We are also a, a meat-free and plastic-free company. We have banned single-use plastic in our organizations. We are committed to transitioning all products and packaging, merchandising to biodegradable and environmentally friendly materials. So our hotels are eco-friendly and our upcoming university campus, which is being built right now, will utilize both wind and solar energy. E-commerce has been the base of all our, all our group uh, companies. And in a sense, it has empowered entrepreneurs in developing countries, thereby encouraging micro entrepreneurship. So in many ways, we have tried in our part to bring together sustainability. Sustainability means partnerships between us and the local communities at the same time, thinking locally while building globally. Fundamentally, the pandemic has shown uh, a light onto how inextricably we are connected to society and how society is connected to business. The enlightened premise of stakeholder capitalism, even the world's largest organizations are not 
powerful enough to stave off the damage caused by this pandemic. And this shows the flaws in the so-called profits first strategy. Profits are an outcome, not a purpose, and we cannot protect a business in the face of this or other global disruptions. The trade wars that are going is a case in point. These trade blocks that are out there are case in point. Transitioning to a purpose-led business where all stakeholders are organized around a common set of values that benefit society and all business decisions are guided by those values can make organizations far more resilient, sustainable in the face of all types of disruptions from local to global. Hence, this has been something that we have experienced and at this point in time, we feel it's critically important that purpose-driven companies become you know, the uh, credo of the new millennium, because this is the only way we will be able to in merge together with the millennials, centennials, and so on, because they are truly of a different breed. Their understanding of the world and their needs are very different from ours. So in a sense, purpose-driven companies is going to be the bridge that brings us together and hopefully also bring ASEAN together because ASEAN can truly, when it works, be the savior of this region. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dato Sri uh, uh, Vijay. I think the theme of purpose-led, purpose-driven companies uh, is central uh, to this discussion uh, in terms of building uh, sustainable recovery uh, in ASEAN, putting uh, the right values, the emphasis on stakeholder engagement, uh, and so forth. I think it's very significant that you not only highlighted a conceptual view of business in a fundamental difference in the way you do business, but you have also put it in practice uh, in your companies, in your work, um, and, and so forth, uh, um, uh, to, uh, in, in a significant way from your 30 to 40 locations in which you cut across cultures, language, countries uh, in doing business and the diversity of business you are in. I think that sets the stage for the panel. We have four people in the panel uh, and from different backgrounds uh, and experiences, uh, whether business, academia, uh, whether it is in the area of philanthropy, uh, whether it is from a community or solidarity-based uh, economy. And let me invite Mr. Andrew Koo. Uh, and the panel, unfortunately, has only six to seven minutes. Um, so uh, there is a restraint in the time. Uh, Mr. Andrew Koo is chairman and CEO of the Mumil Group. Uh, Mui Group, and over to you, uh, Mr. Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, distinguished speakers and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Uh, we have reached a tipping point, and I believe there is no turning back. Sustainability is here to stay. So why do I say that? because people have permanently changed their priorities due to the pandemic. You know, there has been many false dawns, but this time, all signs point to consumers, investors, governments, all caring about sustainability and the longer term impact on the environment. So case in point, it used to be the case that entrenched lobby groups, uh, oil and gas interests, made it practically impossible to see any technological innovation in the motor vehicle industry. But today, you know, my friends around me have started to receive delivery, delivery of their Teslas. And in fact, I had the opportunity to sit in one just last week. So EV cars is something unheard of previously, but we are now at the cusp of electric vehicles going mass market. 
there is no turning back. Uh, Deloitte, Deloitte Global's 2020 readiness report found that 90% of surveyed C-suite executives agree the impacts of climate change will negatively affect their organizations. And 59% already have sustainability initiatives in place. So in my opinion, there are four key considerations that businesses must consider when reinventing business strategies to sustain sustainability going forwards. So the first one, start with the articulation of your mission statement. An organization can attract and engage its various stack stakeholders by having an inspiring purpose articulated in a mission statement. In his book, Start With Why, the author Simon Sinek believes that when that what differentiates great leaders and companies is that they make it easy for people to understand the why behind them. So an organization can achieve sustainable sales and long-term growth when it earns the trust from its customers, customers and other partners. This is best achieved when they understand the why. So that's exactly what we did this year. We actually did away with our vision, mission, and values and came up with just a very simple purpose statement, which is as follows. This is for our organization. So our purpose statement is to be a leader in creating sustainable growth and delivering positive impact to all stakeholders by inspiring innovation. So my personal vision is to have MUI become a purpose-driven organization that not only makes a meaningful contribution to society, but also bringing meaning to people's lives, including, of course, all our employees. So having a clear purpose statement uh, outlining the importance of sustainability is a very critical platform. So the second thing I think that organizations can do is set realistic goals that, that is relevant to your business model and that can make a real impact. So for example, companies should look at their business model to see how it is compatible with a net zero economy. Uh, you know, every little step to address sustainability can make a difference. Sometimes you need to take those little steps first. The third thing, the boards and the audit committee should consider re-evaluating their framework for overseeing ESG performance. Because simply put, investors are placing increasing importance on ESG factors. Critics of ESG investing argue that there is an overall lack of data disclosure. But I believe, and it's proven, there has been substantial progress on ESG reporting. So further work needs to be done in this area. And then fourth and finally, in the future, attracting employees and investors will obviously depend on having these sustainability features be part of the overall strategies. Employees want it, customers want it, investors want it. So we should all get on board and focus on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andrew Koo. I think uh, you seem to uh, take on a similar theme as Dato uh, Sri just now on purpose-driven company, purpose-driven organization. I'm familiar with the book, uh, Purpose Driven Life. Um, and this is coming as a key feature now in business uh, and your four uh, business strategies uh, center around a uh, very strong value base uh, to sustainability, uh, to ESG, um, and in operational ways, how does that impact your investor, your customer, uh, your employee, um, uh, employers, uh, employees uh, in this context? Let me pass the time on to Professor
uh, any co, uh, Professor Emeritus of Finance, um, Practice Finance, okay, from Singapore Management University. Uh, and over to you, Prof, uh, for your analysis and review, not just of the Singapore model, uh, but how it impacts um, ASEAN as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennison, and a very warm uh, greeting to all those who have stayed. We have about 150 people online, so I'm going to try and get to all of you because I think this panel discussion is critical. Um, first of all, everyone on this call must be ASEAN champions, and I think uh, thank you to Tan Sri, Michael Yeo, and his team. Every year we could do this, I think, in Kuala Lumpur, but we now have to do this virtually. But the passion for ASEAN never disappears. So I never got a chance to talk to Dr. Vijay for a while, but I'm so glad he started with the word purpose. So I'm going to share a little bit about um, the different business families that I work with. Um, a lot of them are actually very much focused on ASEAN. And I think they are actually led by next generation leaders today. So uh, as Dr. VJ and all of you have uh, articulated, the vision for our next generation to be leaders is to be responsible and sustainable leaders. And I think the timing is perfect. I think um, the last 18 months, we all came to a realization that the world is very connected and so is ASEAN. And while this whole morning, we all recognize the potential in ASEAN and recognizing also the challenges, I thought, let's shift gear a little bit and ask ourselves, what does it take to be responsible and sustainable leaders? And I think across the times, uh, all of us are actually very aligned. So Vijay talk about purpose. I'm going to speak about three Ps and you could tell immediately the first P is purpose. I think every business family within the ASEAN arena have always been led by value system because they are building not just for their current generation, but for other generations to come. And so they do not want the name to be carried that will be taught. And they do want a good name so that their children and their grandchildren will be proud of that name. So that purpose-driven agenda is very much in the DNA of so many of our business families. And this time round, we are all united because the world is changing towards looking at ESG. And I call ESG not something new. ESG has been in our arena and you will understand why in a while. But the first E is environmental. And I think we are all starting to wake up that we can't leave a world for our grandchildren uh, where they could not and, and not understand what polar bears look like anymore because the ice caps are all melting. So we want to leave a better world. And multi-stakeholder capitalism has that in mind. So I just came across recently a business family and they used to do the three-in-one coffee brand. So you know what I'm talking about, the super brand. And they sold it and there was a liquidation event and they now set up a family office. And of course, it's headquartered in Singapore. And uh, young uh, leaders, all right, both uh, sister and brother team, together with their father, they all came together and said, we want to name the super brand family office Apricots Capital. And Apricots now have this pool of money so that we can do it right. So ESG investing is in their mandate. And because you do have a new pot of money, so you could do it right by investing in things which are sustainable, which are green, and you can call uh, the shots in a way because you are having the role of an investor. And they are very reasonable. They are also investing in not so green, but with the understanding that the journey towards being green will happen. Because now that we are a core investor in your company, so Marco Polo Marine is not very green when they first invested in them. But through the restructuring uh, of the debt equity, they are now guiding Marco Polo towards renewables. So now you can actually have vessels that are going onto the sea and then, you know, able to generate solar power in order to run it. So these are the kind of um, incentives when you have a purpose-driven uh, 
you know, family with a family office. Now, a second P that I'm going to talk about, and it, I think resonate with so many of you on this panel, it's people. I don't think we want to be building a business just for our own families. And in many ways, when you speak to business families across ASEAN, the word people actually refer to a bigger extended family. Their workers are people. And um, I've come across many of our business families when they invest in other countries. So I'm going to mention my PBA group uh, that I'm on the advisory board. So they're in robotics and automation. Uh, when I line them up to meet up with Penang and, uh, you know, H, uh, you know, uh, that of YB, he actually said, we do not think we could afford a lot of your robotics and automation, uh, you know, equipment, but it will be great if you could invest in helping our people. So this whole morning, you were talking about how to get governments on board. I think government's biggest challenge today is creating jobs creating good, sustainable jobs. So if you invest into any part of ASEAN, can you bring with it not just money for the business, but also investing in the talent in the countries? So PBA said, fine, we have a race academy, which is the Robotics and Automation Center of Excellence. So we have a set of curriculum. Let's set up race academy in Penang and then collaborate with partners there so that we could upgrade the skills of many of the people. And young people would love to be in robotics. So that would be a way in which we could help develop people and bring everybody along because that was the message I'm hearing from uh, earlier speakers as well. And the last P is about partnerships. I'm delighted when the title of this forum is ASEAN Leadership and Partnership. Uh, you can't build anything sustainable if you are not investing in R&D and innovation. And I think earlier, um, you know, Dr. Henry Go was talking a lot about that as well. So nobody is a monopoly on knowledge and innovation. So the best way to go about it is we invest in the ecosystem. So we are starting to see families pivot and change. Their core business might be in traditional building environment, but that does not stop the next generation investing in startups that will help turn the buildings green. So it's a journey. And when you think long term, like most business families do, then that journey becomes a lot more pleasant if we are bringing everyone on board. We are bringing partners across ASEAN on board. So we are starting to see that. We are starting to see many business families set up their own incubation plus their own uh, fund. So we have families that are into agri-tech, we have families that are into prop tech, and they're starting to do that. And I have a wonderful family, Go Bell, and they have, uh, you know, incubation fund as well. And now they're starting to look at talent and technology coming together in the different countries. So they are in um, Thailand, they are in Indonesia, they are in Philippines, and I call this my future. The hope of all of ASEAN is in our next generation coming together and be the star, the lights towards building a more sustainable ASEAN towards the three Ps, purpose, people, and partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Any, I think uh, the you you seem to have uh, complemented and strengthened um, the content of the discussion by bringing into a center focus people and partnership uh, to complement purpose. I have not heard the term multi-stakeholder capitalism. Uh, maybe Ben can unpack. Uh, that term, but uh, that's quite interesting. Um, if I could uh, jump in, Dr. Dennison, sure. that came from Klaus Schwab, uh, okay. the World Economic Forum, all right, about three years ago. And I think this uh, afternoon, I was so pleased also to hear, uh, you know, uh, the digital uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Go Peng, we talk about the new capitalism, the new socialism. So I think suddenly overnight, everyone uh, is aligned. So even um, Xi Jinping talk about the common prosperity. Okay. Uh, you can't grow if you don't include everyone. Yes, 
Uh, Malaysia has the shared prosperity theme common. I think this is the right time for Dr. Ben Cunyones, who is in solidarity economy, who is an economist by training uh, and working for years uh, on poverty based in Manila, but he was in Kuala Lumpur for many years and is part of a regional and global movement uh, which is called ASEAN Solidarity Economy Council uh, that seeks to bring people, planet, profit, uh, values, as well as governance uh, into the business forum. Over to you, Dr. Ben. Thank you, Dato Denison, distinguished members of the discussion panel, ladies and gentlemen. There is actually now a tool that is being used to promote responsible business practices. The tool is called Environmental, Social, and Governance Framework, or ESG. ESG has gained increasing attention over the past few years, with many institutional investors investing only in those companies that provide ESG performance reporting and has become a key topic of discussion at the board table. Institutional investors nowadays give importance to ESG because it has a significant impact on four fundamental business issues relevant to the long-term success of any company. First, corporate governance, which is expected to enhance customer and investor acquisition. Second, risk reduction, aimed at reducing disruptions and losses. And this has become a big factor in this time of the COVID pandemic. Third, opportunity management, which aims at enhancing worker productivity and organizational resilience. And fourth, culture and intrinsic value, which drives the search for new markets, customers, product services, and revenue streams. In my organization, the Asian Solidarity Economic Council, or ASEC, where Dato Dinesan himself serves as the chairman, we use a similar framework that we call five dimensions of social enterprise. First, social responsible governance. Second, edifying ethical values that guide the policies and programs of the organization, and the triple bottom line or triple piece. The first P is people, which stands for the social dimension. The second P it stands for planet, which stands for uh, environmental dimension. And the third P is, uh, stands for profit or for prosperity and sustainable de development dimension. With this framework, ASEC has identified around 70 social enterprises in several countries of Asia, which have attracted investment from investors who view opportunities via the five dimensions framework, which is really similar to the ESG framework. At the recent launch of the Social Investment for Community Empowerment Program of ASEC on October 5, 2021, on the occasion of the Global Social Economy Forum, ASEC featured social enterprises that have gained market foothold for product services such as solar powered cold storage, community cafes and restaurants run by the youth, apparels for export to fair trade markets, microfinance, and microinsurance. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Denison, distinguished panelists and participants, in conclusion, for purposes of advancing responsible business practices more widely, I would strongly recommend building partnerships, especially between for-profit companies and the triple bottom line social enterprises. Partnership with social enterprises is increasing in many countries, especially where CSR compliance is being encouraged by the government. Many CSR companies have found it more cost-effective to invest in the innovative products and services of triple bottom line social enterprise. Further, the CSR companies are able to maintain reasonable financial returns from their social investments while being able to reap enormous social returns by reaching out to the marginalized, disadvantaged, and vulnerable to the social enterprise uh, in various countries of Asia. With around 70 social enterprises increasing in our network, ASEC is in the midst of facilitating ESG-based partnerships to reach out to millions of potential customers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben, for highlighting uh, the solidarity model, which in some ways is 
uh, you're linking it to this multi-stakeholder capitalism uh, in terms of a smart partnership between for-profit and triple bottom line uh, in terms of finding some solidarity that the uh, purpose people and partnership become central. Um, and, and, and the COVID uh, context, and uh, Dr. Ben has done a lot of work on this on the ground, uh, has enabled actually more local neighborhood-based, community-based groups to become resilient and survive uh, where others could not uh, in the sort of market area uh, through more cooperative, collaborative, uh, friendly, neighborly support for one another, uh, but to keep uh, resilient families going in the context of communities. So I think there are a lot of alternative models uh, that big business and small business can look onto, and we can find this kind of synergy and partnership uh, in this multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, and look at new innovations uh, in fulfilling uh, this ESG uh, compliance um, that uh, we talked about here. Let me invite uh, the last and final speaker, Ms. Mafuza Khan. I hope I pronounced it right. I know Khan um, is right. Um, uh, Executive Officer of Asia, uh, philanthropy circle. Uh, sorry for my mispronunciation. Over to you for your six or seven minutes. Thank you again, Dr. Dennison and esteemed organizers, panelists, and all the participants who are here. So I will not be speaking directly about responsible business because I am in the business of philanthropy. And, and as many of you know, the word philanthropy originates from the Greek word, and it means love of humanity. And when we talk about love of humanity, that's a value. So a lot has been said today here about purpose and, and value-driven work, whether it's in business or in other spheres of work. Um, Asia Philanthropy Circle, I'll just give a very brief uh, sort of outline of what Asia Philanthropy Circle does. It is a membership-based platform and a peer-to-peer -peer network of philanthropists in Asia. And our mission is to catalyze private action for public good by collaborating through strategic philanthropy, meaning thinking about philanthropic work in the long term, using philanthropic capital as patient capital to bring about systemic changes to address social and environmental challenges that we face. And, and philanthropy is not anything new. And philanthropy is, is not uh, something that only wealthy, high net worth individuals can do. Philanthropy is present in every community and, and, and you will see there is data that shows actually that relatively speaking, the poor give a lot to each other, whether it's through these self-help solidarity economies or other forms where you go. So I think given when we talk about philanthropy in the context of business, one has to look at it across a spectrum. So, you know, the old model, as we were talking about, where shareholder profits were the only goals and purpose of business is shifting. And I, and I do agree that we have reached a tipping point where there is no turning back. Uh, I think the question is, how long will it take? How long will this transition to a new kind of economy where, where we don't compartmentalize you know, economic activity with social and environmental outcomes. I think that's in the old style of business, on the one hand, you would be polluting the rivers and maybe through, through you know, CSR or something else, you would be helping the community. And it's still a challenge. I think 
the future and, and what we need to focus on is how to align work across the different entities. And especially when we talk about family businesses, there are some very positive uh, examples, new, new approaches to, to doing exactly that. But before I go into that, I'd also just like to sort of, again, this is not anything new, everyone knows this, that, you know, um, business and philanthropy in Asia, as well as in other parts of the world, have gone hand in hand for a long time, particularly in the early days of industry, you know, when you had agriculture and manufacturing, it was very common practice for businesses to invest in the communities where they operated, whether it was to provide you know, education or healthcare or what have you. The second piece is that, you know, and this is a relatively new trend that you are finding collaboration and coordination across entities within a family enterprise. So we have some good examples from, from our membership also, and I'll bring up the, uh, an example from Malaysia. Uh, the YTL Foundation, which is based in Malaysia and is a part of the YTL group, rather their philanthropic activity, is focused on education. So when COVID hit and you know, student, students were forced to do distance learning and virtual learning, they partnered with YTL Communications and distributed mobile phones, data, and SIMs for underserved students who did not have access to those resources. And then thirdly, I think what's also increasingly important, and then again, seeing it across a spectrum that you have different kinds of philanthropic capital and new forms of finance that are working with private capital or public capital, both to test new things, to innovate, as well as to basically grow the pie bigger. It's not a zero sum game. You know, the, the objective is to have more resources for, I will just say, for example, to meet the sustainable development goals. So you can have things like blended finance, where basically you bring in philanthropic capital and sort of de-risk private capital. Um, you can have other forms of philanthropic capital going into things like social impact bonds or development impact bonds. And you can have things like recoverable loans, like if a grant is very successful and achieves everything, both its social mission and its financial bottom line in terms of even nonprofits have a business model and they need to have revenues. Those revenues could be in the form of grants. Those revenues could be in other kinds of you know, social enterprise kind of work. If you have a membership-based organization, it could be for your membership fees. So it's again to look at how do you, again, innovate financing in a way that philanthropic capital can leverage other forms of capital. And often because sometimes investors won't invest in something because it is risky, it can de-risk, it can also, you know, for many philanthropies, okay, it's a test. We've learned something from it, even if the grant doesn't work. So there is that iterative process where you can learn something and then you partner with government at different levels. It could be at a, you know, more at the local level or it could be at the national level to really scale because ultimately, even though, you know, the number of high net individuals high net worth individuals in the world has grown quite a bit in the last decade, you have to partner with government to scale social outcomes. So there are different ways to do that. And I think that's where sort of some of the promises lie and collaboration is not easy. It takes time and, and you know, it takes, it takes the ability to let go of some control and it's really about engagement. So partnerships are essential. And those are, I think, at least in this, on this panel, we've heard the word purpose, values, partnerships, and next gen come up. And ESG is the broad sort of header for this pipeline. And they all go hand in hand. So I would say, you know, philanthropy, though a drop in the bucket in the scheme of things. Is, is, is very good for leveraging other forms of capital 
it's it's also about values um, it's about the ability to be there for the long run and not just be in and out um, and it's about really driving partnerships when when other sectors might not be in a position to because in some ways it's it's uh, it's in a good place to be a convener of different stakeholders and and we were talking about stakeholder capitalism because obviously many philanthropists are also successful business leaders so i think it's sort of really leveraging that role to be to be at the table or to convene those tables where we can come together, unite, whether it's as ASEAN or as, as global citizens, because it's also about regional leadership. And that's one thing APC is trying to do, because so far institutional philanthropy, for obvious reasons, has been led by the West. You know, you had the Rockefellers and what have you. 200 years ago, and, and that kind of wealth is relatively new in this region. So it's also about providing an Asian brand of philanthropy, but participating globally and being able to provide global leadership for those values-driven, purpose-driven outcomes that we're all aspiring to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Khan, for the emphasis on love for humanity also centering about values, but, um, um, you know, investment, people's participation, uh, innovative capitalism, uh, these themes. Uh, but uh, often, sometimes words are misunderstood. Uh, sometimes philanthropy is misunderstood as just charity and not justice and not addressing root issues of injustice, fair wages, social security, workers' protection and rights, uh, these sort of issues as well, which um, sustainable business must address um, people's um, self-actualization and like what you said, investing into communities. I can think of the Tata businesses in India that played quite a major role. Many Japanese companies have done that uh, as well uh, in terms of uh, workers and so forth. Um, I'm, uh, uh, if Zaim can help me in terms of time, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. I see some points on the chat. Uh, let me see, there was a greeting earlier um, uh, for Dr. Ben and so forth. There is something I'm glad um, attending the forum, the forum look forward, uh, how, how to make use of business model to improve lives, um, conserve the environment and address sustainable development. I thought that was what the panel was doing, uh, but maybe you might, um, maybe Ed, Edgar is asking for um, the forum is a for, oh, forward looking one and accommodates various views uh, on how. Okay, it's more a statement rather than a question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any, any questions or comments anyone wants to raise? or the panelists wants to compliment uh, one another at this point, uh, that is possible uh, as well in a quick uh, intervention, uh, whether uh, Mr. Andrew or uh, Professor Any, you want to intervene uh, to reiterate a point or uh, in a minute or two, would that be, or Dr. Ben, uh, to complement one another on the direction forward for ASEAN. I think there is a lot of complementary uh, thinking uh, in the group. Uh, I think it's a major shift uh, to um, social and environmental uh, compliance by businesses. I think that shift has taken place. So it's more in the practice 
the impact, the level of investment that people would put it uh, to ensure its sustainability. Uh, any parting words um, from the panel? I can start with um, anyone. Uh, if you, yes, uh, Dr. Any, Professor Thank Any. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dennison. I think I love uh, all the comments from everybody. So if I could just uh, finish up by saying that, uh, although I'm a finance professor, I'm a strong believer in social capital as well. So, you know, every time when we look at fishes, um, they tend to swim in a shoal. So if fishes are swimming in ASEAN ocean, uh, we should not just think about F, which is financial capital alone, uh, but we should think about I as well, which stands for infrastructure or intellectual capital. I think there's a lot of emphasis in ASEAN about building connectivity. So infrastructure is a large part of that. Digital connectivity is in the I. I love it that uh, you know we have the philanthropy angle because S is social capital. Uh, when we do ESG, a lot of time people keep talking about E, but they forgot about the S, and that's the social capital, which in a nutshell is bringing everyone along. Women, children, youth, and the less privileged uh, citizens within our community. And I love my H as well, because H stands for human capital. I don't think any one of our founders and leaders will go very far if they do not pay attention to developing the people who are working with them and for them. So let's all be fishes in the deep blue sea. And uh, we are stronger if we all swim together to build back better and broader. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Annie. I think um, uh, when we are swimming in the ocean, there are also sharks and others that might swallow us. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the solidarity, sometimes big business swallows small ones. There is exploitative business of migrant workers and the suffering uh, and so forth. But I think I get the point. Uh, your emphasis on human people development is central and not only government, but businesses have an important role. Um, Anyone else wants to come in before I wind up? Yes, Dr. Ben. Yeah, I'd just like to stress that though, that uh, it's high time for ASEAN, you know, because uh, our theme is rebuilding ASEAN towards sustainable recovery. It's high time for ASEAN to really consider, you know, the uh, partnerships between uh, the uh, social enterprises and uh, the uh, big companies. Because uh, many companies really have suffered. In the Philippines, uh, uh, there's so many uh, enterprises, uh, companies, you know, well-established companies that closed shop because of the pandemic. And of course, uh, they, are, uh, they are not uh, coming up, you know, uh, to invest uh, because in, in their previous uh, uh, endeavors or businesses, because uh, that one has lost uh, customers. Uh, so, uh, the challenge is uh, how uh, to convince this, uh, you know, a businessman to consider partnering with social enterprises. And the big uh, uh, challenge, really, the big uh, constraining factor is the lack of information about social enterprise. And uh, if, uh, therefore, uh, uh, I, I, I see here a big role for uh, our organization, ASEC, to provide the information. And I would like to thank, uh, use this occasion uh, to thank Dato Denison, because he was the one who provided, you know, the title for our new forum, the Social Investments for Community Empowerment. Mm -hmm. And this one, we are planning, you know, to um, provide, you know, a, a more uh, visible, uh, I mean, uh, presence, you know, of uh, businessmen, social investors, because we really believe that this is the time, you know, to break through, to really reach out for partnerships. Uh, because I believe in my heart, it is not a subsidy that will make the poor marginalized sustainable. It is the business model, yeah? So if we can transform, you know, uh, these uh, organizations of the poor into social enterprises that become sustainable, 
then they become you know uh, uh, partners in the creation of wealth for the nation mm. uh, in uh, building you know the new economy uh, under this new dispensation and this should be what we should be thinking, should be thinking. to make you know uh, rebuild ASEAN. So thank you, uh, Dato. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ben. I think Dr. Ben made a very important point. Uh, looking at the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN uh, community as a whole that has highlighted uh, people to people ASEAN. Uh, and so a lot of our forums, I've been part uh, of this uh, leadership and other interaction uh, is more big business, people on the top, uh, intellectuals, um, heads of civil society, academia, but not really grassroots uh, people. Uh, so creating a forum, uh, which is people to people um, of local communities, cooperatives, uh, milk vendors, uh, this kind, migrant workers movement, will create a greater solidarity of the people's movement. And Ben's point that it's not subsidy, uh, but actually really building uh, the economic wealth uh, of the poor, uh, not through charity, but uh, through business, uh, sustainable business, becomes quite critical. I know time is passing, but if uh, Mr. Andrew Ku or Ms. Khan have uh, a point, and then I'll wind up and pass the time back uh, to Zain. I think, no, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting topic. And I think there's a real convergence, you know, in this area of sustainability. Uh, you know, when the, when governments like 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 the Malaysian government has put it into its 12th economic plan, when the largest investor group, BlackRock, has made this a very important feature, and when Tomasic is also coming in, you can see there's a real convergence that this is becoming a very key feature in everything going forwards. And it's really not necessarily top down, it's bottoms up. It's coming from stakeholders, it's coming from employees, it's coming from customers. So I think the key point to note is that companies, leaders should take this seriously and not be left behind. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Uh, good, good team. Ms. Khan, a parting word? Sure, let's work together. That's work all together. I have to say, let's work together. Yes. Okay. I uh, respond to that poll, yes. Okay, let's work together in multi-stakeholder, uh, whether it is multi-stakeholder capitalism, whether it's uh, purpose-led, uh, but people must be at the heart of business, people must be at the heart of inclusive development, people must be at the heart of uh, ASEAN wealth and prosperity. Uh, that the disparities do not widen so wide uh, or that the poor still remain poor in our neighborhoods among the 600 over million uh, ASEAN. Um, and as we have seen, not just in this discussion, but throughout uh, the kind of sense of being an ASEAN community breaking out of the nation state to have a more regional outlook. That, that would still take time because sometimes we tend to think ourselves as Filipino or Malaysian or Singaporean or Indonesian uh, or our sub identities. But beyond that, if we take, we are a humanity together, we are ASEAN uh, and we are fishes swimming in the ocean. I hope we are not confined to the South China Sea, uh, but as, as we move together, uh, then we see that we need leadership that is innovative, that would recognize the trends and changes. We need to recognize that partnership is at the heart of it, that all of ASEAN is important and that we need to work together. With those words, thank you very much to KSI, to Tantri Michael Yo, uh, to the panel. I know that uh, Vijay is not with us. I don't see 
uh, him online, but thank you to each one on this panel because you brought uh, richness from your own expertise, your own training and experience, and that's add, added to the value uh, of this discussion. So thank you and over back to Zain uh, at KSI. And thank you.